I'm here today with Linda Rodenberg, who is the CEO and co-founder of Endeavor, an incredible organization that funds entrepreneurs all across the globe. Uh, Linda, cannot thank you enough for having me over today. Really, really appreciate it. Uh, before we begin and talk about Endeavor, let's talk a little bit about where you grew up, because that's an integral part of how you got to where you are today. Uh, I couldn't agree more. I grew up in Newton, Massachusetts, just outside of Boston. I'm the eldest of three kids, and my parents met when they were 14 and 16 at a dance in Rhode Island, were childhood sweethearts. Uh, my father was a lawyer and has stayed at the same job for his entire career. Uh -huh. My mom taught some, and then by the time my brother was born, became a full-time mom. So I had a very stable childhood. And so I think part of my desire to shake things up is that I know that I have stability at the core. So I, I went on to, to Harvard and then to Yale Law School, and when I came back and told my parents that I was not going to become a lawyer, and that in fact I was going off to Latin America, uh, they were somewhat taken aback. Got ya, got ya, got ya. So you decided not to become a lawyer, yeah. uh, and uh, what happened after you went to law school, what sort of drove you to do something entrepreneurial? Well, when I told my parents that I was taking what they thought was a year off in Latin America, first in Chile, then Argentina, uh, they assumed that then I would come back from my sabbatical and, you know, go into a law firm or at least a consulting firm. Right. And instead what happened was I started working for an organization called Ashoka uh, after a year of doing projects here and there. And it was helping support social entrepreneurs around the world. These are people, innovators in the nonprofit sector. It was a wonderful organization founded by a great innovator, Bill Drayton. And it was a wonderful experience. And yet I was noticing that there were no jobs and that everybody I was meeting in restaurants and through friends in Buenos Aires where I was living at that point felt that they didn't want a government job but no one else was hiring. Maybe there were five big companies and I kept saying, why aren't you starting a business? And they said, you can't do that. And I tell the story of Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak in the garage and they said, look, Linda, this is Latin America. No one is funding me to start my crazy idea, and I don't even have a garage. Right. And, and then the clincher for me is just like shortly after these conversations, I was in a taxi in, uh, on the way to a meeting and found that my taxi driver had an engineering degree. And I was like, okay, you are going to be an entrepreneur. He, he said, I don't know what you're talking about. And I said, well, what's the word in Spanish? And he came up with empresario, which meant this big business person who people thought usually had government kickbacks. And, I, and there was no word at that point to describe innovation and an entrepreneurship. Today, of course, the word emprendedor is, is, uh, has taken off. But at that point, and that's what got me. I said, OK, if they don't even have a word, and they don't have financial support, and they don't have emotional support, because if you told your parents that you were going to be starting a business, you would probably be kicked out of the house. Right. Failure was not an option. So you, you came up with this, this idea. And then how, um, how did you execute it? I went back to the US. I started talking about this idea that you needed business entrepreneurs in emerging markets. And then a number of people introduced me to Peter Kellner, who was this other crazy kid who had started companies in Russia and Eastern Europe. And he was talking about you know, entrepreneurs in emerging markets as well. So the two of us got together. And our first meeting was at my parents' kitchen table in, in Boston, literally on a napkin. And my parents overheard us talking about this. And my mom said, you're 28. I had two kids and a third on the way at this time. And you've got to stop getting on planes if you want to find a husband. Yeah. Uh, and I just looked and I said, you know what? I, I want all these things eventually, but I have to do this. This is just something I have to do. And Peter then told my parents he was going to take a semester off of business school, so he was going to share in the risk. And off we went. And uh, at this time, it was 1997. The Thai bot had just collapsed, so emerging markets were imploding. No one thought this was a good idea. But I just, oh my God, I'd seen too much talent. Uh -huh. And I knew there were great ideas. And I knew if we could just marry a few stories with some people that had the expertise, the mentoring, and the capital, that, that then this would come to life and it would be easier to sell. Um, so one of the first people we, we met, Peter actually called me 
down, he, he went down to Buenos Aires. I was in New York setting up shop and looking for funders. He said, Linda, I've gotten you a 10 minute meeting with this guy, Eduardo Elstein. Now, Eduardo had famously walked into George Soros' office and come out with a $10 million investment in real estate in Argentina. And at that point, George Soros was the largest real estate owner in, large, in Argentina. So I had a 10 minute meeting, I flew to Argentina, Five minutes into the meeting with Eduardo, he looks at his watch and says, I know you want a meeting with George Soros. I'll see what I can do. And I said, no, Eduardo, I'm an entrepreneur. This is an organization about entrepreneurs. You're an entrepreneur. I want your time, your passion, and $200,000. <laughs> so he turns to his right-hand man, this guy, Oscar Tabor, and he says, esta chica esta loca. And he says, you know, it's like you were in a movie and she, the, she, the character seems charming and then you're suddenly in the shower and she's coming at you with a knife. <laughs> so I said, uh, Eduardo, estoy decepcionado. You know, I'm disappointed. I speak Spanish. I heard you. And this from the guy who walked into Soros and came out with $10 million. You're lucky I only asked you for 200000 And he, he turned around. I didn't know what he was going to do. And he bent down, picked up his checkbook and signed on the spot. He became chairman of Endeavor Argentina, and I proudly wore La Chica Loca badge of honor ever since. You know, I look at some of your biography, and, and, and you know, it states that you guys have interviewed 37,000 yeah. potential entrepreneurs, that you've actually funded 1,000 entrepreneurs. What's that process like? Yeah, people say it's harder to become an Endeavor entrepreneur than to get into Harvard Business School. So to start off, we, before we go into a country, we get the local, the top business leaders really engaged. Mm -hmm. So Endeavor is now operating in 20 countries. We have 20 local boards, and these are the top business leaders. So we convince, like Eduardo, if there's one thing you can do for your country, it's to find and mentor these younger generation of business innovators, but you don't know who they are, because you're not getting out of your small little circles. And so Endeavor has a process for scouring you know, every capital city and then eventually outside the capital cities in every industry, we're industry agnostic, for people who have gotten something started. We're about the scale up, not the startup. Mm -hmm. So I think many people who focus on entrepreneurship focus on incubators, accelerators, the startup phase. What we saw is we said, look, you can get something off the ground. Where it really breaks down is when you get to anywhere between a few hundred thousand dollars to up to $20 million, then people get stuck. And this is where the job creation, you talked about helping emerging markets, which mm -hmm. was part of our goal. The job creation, the wealth creation is really going to come if you can kickstart that second level, that next phase. So we find people in every industry, they may be in a family business that's taken over by the next generation, it may be a, an internet company, it may be healthcare. We put them through a series of uh, local interviews. So they go through about six to 12 months of a local interview process. They may be meeting top bankers, top industry experts, people in, uh, you know, in, in healthcare, in biotech, in the internet, whatever they're, they're or people experts in franchising, marketing. We try to get a variety of inputs. And then five times a year, we have like the World Cup of entrepreneurship where we have three-day events. We have experts, venture capitalists from Silicon Valley, top business leaders, CEOs of Fortune 500 companies. They come together over two days, interview in pairs the candidates, and then they have a deliberation. And I moderate these, or somebody on my team, I always call it 12 angry men or women, because one, one person can sway the entire jury or one person can hold out. It has to be unanimous. Okay. So what really comes is this enti very rich dialogue about who has the capability to take it to the next level. Who, what, what's the business model that works, but more importantly, who's the entrepreneur who's gonna be able to make the tough decisions, fire their friends, you know, make the tough choices, get to the next level with just a little bit of help. Um, so as you said, right now we've just selected about 900 entrepreneurs from 600 companies and help them scale their businesses. This year they'll reach close to $7 billion in revenues. They've generated collectively 400,000 jobs. And what makes me most excited is that two-thirds of those jobs and three-quarters of the revenues come after our engagement with them. So it really shows the talent is there, the ideas are there, but the concept of mentorship, the concept of the scale up, I think are, are, are things that really make the difference in terms of taking something from good to great. Um, of the thousand that you've backed, uh, what has been your success rate? 
90 of our companies as of last year, it's probably over 100 now, would have made the Inc. 500 list, wow. which is growing over 600% a year consecutively over three years. That's pretty extraordinary. So we know that the growth rates are usually in the double digits um, and in some in the, in the triple digits. Um, and then there are those that they don't scale. And one interesting thing is when we looked in Brazil and it, we, as a case study of what did those companies that didn't grow or failed have in common, number one thing, lack of a shareholder agreement. And what happened was family and friends were starting ventures together and at some point something went wrong along the way and the relationships faltered and because they didn't have shareholder agreements, the business ended up stagnating. Interesting. Gaia, one phrase you, you, you coined and that is high impact entrepreneur and you mentioned it earlier but take us through that philosophy if you will. Well, part of this was my feistiness. I got upset. I was okay if people called me crazy uh -huh. but I, I, I Every time I would tell a story of what Endeavor was doing, and now we were in the Middle East, and Africa, and Southeast Asia, and people assumed we were doing microcredit. The only th type of entrepreneurship that people in Silicon Valley or people in Wall Street could imagine going on outside of the United States was micro. And I, I think microcredit's fantastic, but I said, no, no, no. These are high growth entrepreneurs. These are people who are changing their communities. These are people who are creating really high wage jobs. They're changing cultures. They're creating this role model effect where people 15 can say, if he can do it, if she can do it, I can too. Right. That was never happening before. So we coined in 2004 the term high impact, which really meant uh, people with the biggest ideas, the greatest potential to scale, and then the ability to not only become um, uh, role models, but to translate that into paying it forward to help the next generation. So we're now tracking how many of our entrepreneurs are becoming angel investors, are becoming mentors. Several have set up their own venture capital shops mm -hmm. as a way to really create this entrepreneurial ecosystem.